Hi, this is Valerie from Aaron Holtz Farms, and I wanted to tell you all about a book that I just read. Uh, I don't usually talk a lot about GMOs, uh, GMO technology, um, on my blogs or videos or anything, mainly because it's just such a big topic. I would like to cover it sometimes, but it's just so huge and super controversial, um, and I just don't have the expertise to deal with that at this time. Um, however, I read a book uh, just in the past few weeks. It took me a few weeks to get through it. It's been a busy time. Uh, but it's this book here uh, is called Seeds of Science, Why We Got It So Wrong on GMOs. And it's by Mark Linus. And this book, it does not fit into one genre. I'm sure they have it kept cataloged as something, but I don't know what it is. Uh, it's, each chapter almost has its own sort of genre. So, um, the first two chapters are biography, uh, of the author. So the author, Mark Linus, originally was an anti-GMO protester. Um, and so the first chapter is about that. And then he, he, looked at the scientific evidence and changed his mind, and he's actually now pro-GMO. And so the second chapter is how he changed his mind and, and why. And then he starts going into some history in chapters 3, 4, and 7. Uh, so he talks about the scientists that um, discovered or invented genetic engineering. Uh, he has an entire chapter on the history of Monsanto, uh, Monsanto, of course, is not the only company that deals with uh, genetic engineering and that sort of technology, but it's sort of the poster child um, for anything to do with the GMO discussion. So he has an entire chapter on just the history of Monsanto, good, bad, everything. And then uh, if you skip to chapter 7, there's sort of a uh, history of the anti-GMO movement as well. And in between there, uh, chapters 5 and 6 are what I think are the most disturbing chapters of the book. Um, one is about farmers who use GMOs and, and some fights to be able to use them or not. And uh, There have been claims that uh, GMO technology has caused farmers to commit suicide, so the author looks at that and sort of debunks that claim. And then uh, chapter 6 is about uh, Africa and how GMO technology has very successfully been kept out of basically the entire continent of Africa and the, the, the fear-mongering that has allowed for that. Um, and then Chapters 8 and 9 were probably the most difficult to get through. Um, chapter 8 is sort of a philosophical discussion about the uh, economic and political stuff behind uh, providing GMO technology to farmers and whether it should be public sector or private sector and all this sort of stuff. Um, that was hard for me to get through just because I'm not big on philosophy, but it was interesting. Uh, chapter 9 was sort of a, a look at why people cling to certain beliefs, whether they're right or wrong, and and it talks about, like the author talks about why it took so long for him to change his mind, um, and then chapter 10 is just sort of a conclusion, but it has a much cooler title than conclusion. It says 20 years of failure and why, after 20 years, uh, GMO crops are only used in a handful of countries and a handful of crops, and why is that? And he basically makes the case that, well, it's because the anti-GMO movement has been super successful. And so, yeah, it's really... It looks at so many different issues. Uh, he actually says in the book that um, he tried to find, you know, a, a good 
good side to the anti-GMO movement or whatever, uh, just because A, he used to be part of it, and B, he felt his book was super biased, and he really had a hard time doing that until you get to the chapter, um, How Environmentalists Think, and, and the, the also the one about, um, what anti-GMO activists got right, which is talking about, um, the balance of power, and political stuff uh, to do with GMO technology. Uh, so, yeah, this book was really disturbing. It taught me a lot. Um, yeah, I guess just if you want to know more about uh, genetically modified crops and that technology, I would highly recommend reading this book. There were just two sections I wanted to read to you. Um, the first being uh, a paragraph that's in this sort of conclusion chapter. He says, so what might a fairer summary of the overall impact of genetically modified crops be? A 2014 meta-analysis combining the outputs of nearly 150 separate peer-reviewed studies concluded that GMO technology adoption has reduced chemical pesticide use by 37%, increased crop yields by 22%, and increased farmer profits by 68% globally. Most of these farmers, incidentally, are in developing countries. This global aggregate picture, of course, lumps together a huge amount of data, some positive, some negative, but it should at least give green groups pause, I would have thought, that the technology they have been opposing for 20 years has reduced chemical pesticide use by 37%. Certainly, I had no idea when I first began to campaign against Monsanto and Roundup Ready that GM would actually reduce the use of chemicals in farming. Almost all these reductions come from insecticides reduced by the BT trait. Herbicide tolerance has mostly just changed the types of herbicides used, shifting most world use towards glyphosate. Um, so that's sort of a summary of some of his arguments in the book. And then uh, this next paragraph, it, it's in the, the chapter, How Environmentalists Think, and this chapter talks a lot about why arguing with people who are against GMOs almost isn't helpful. Um, I'm just going to read it, because he says it much better than I do. When I read Haight's assertion that conscious reasoning is carried out largely for the purpose of persuasion rather than discovery, this immediately made me reconsider my own experience. The story I had been telling myself was that I reasoned my way out of anti-GMO beliefs through discovering and assimilating scientific information that I had earlier been lacking. As I remembered shamefully, I hadn't even known what DNA, DNA stood for during my old crop trashing days. This seemed to make me a case study for the deficit model, where new information can change someone's mind by addressing their lack of knowledge. And yet, I also knew that I had had plenty of opportunities to learn more about why GMOs might not be so bad back in my anti-GMO days, and I had not been in the least bit interested in taking those opportunities. When I debated with pro-GMO scientists in the media or at events, it was not to learn more about their perspective. It was to defeat them. The more conclusively, the better. So far as I was concerned, it was the scientists who were narrow-minded, not me. Years later, I was asked by one of these same experts, a genetics professor at a college in Oxford, if there was anything he could have said differently at the time to convince me. I told him I didn't think so. It wasn't that their arguments lacked force. 
Their mistake was to think that their arguments mattered much at all. And that, that paragraph was just, there was sort of a light bulb that went off for me, because I was like, wow, that's kind of how it feels. Like, I, I've talked to people uh, sometimes about the GMO issue, sometimes about other issues, and, you know, I, I give them scientific arguments for whatever I want to say, and they just don't care. And, and that always sort of puzzled me, or they shoot back other scientific arguments that I kind of didn't care about. Also, um, although I generally tried to look into, um, conflicting claims and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was just crazy to think, oh, like, it's not just scientific arguments. And he goes on to talk about, um, the groups that we associate with and how they influence how we think and what we want to think and, and all this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I'm going to stop talking and tell you if you want to know more about the GMO issue, go get this book, Seeds of Science, Why We Got It So Wrong on GMOs by Mark Linus. Read it for yourself. Let me know what you think. Have a good day.